Hello folks, in this video I'm going to show you how to create this fighting game in Python using Pygame. Now, I'm going to code this game from scratch, so I will take you through the entire process including setting up the game loop, creating the players, adding animations, and then setting up all the fighting mechanics around that. So let's just jump straight into the code and begin with the project setup. So first you will need to make sure you have Python and Pygame installed on your machine, and then you will need some kind of editor to type your code in. Now there's different ones to choose from, but I use Sublime Text Editor. Next, let's have a look at the folder structure. So I've got this Brawler tutorial folder. This is my root folder that all of my files are going to be in. And within that, I've got my two main files. So main.py and fighter.py. Both of them are empty to begin with. And in addition to that, I also have an assets folder here. So this is where all my images and audio and fonts are going to go. So you need to make sure that you set up your folder structure in the same way, just to avoid any errors as you go along with the code. So let's begin by creating the initial game structure. Now, first of all, I need to import Pygame. And then we initialize Pygame by saying pygame.init. After that, I will create my game window. So I'll add a little note here to say create game window. And I will set a couple of variables for it. So the first one is going to be the width. So I say screen width is equal to 1000 pixels. And then the second one is the screen height, which I will make equal to 600 pixels. Now we'll create the game window itself. So I'll say screen, uh, remove caps, screen is equal to pygame.display.set underscore mode. So this function will create a game window for me and will assign it to this variable screen. Now this will take two initial arguments, and these are the screen width and the screen height. Now with that done, I'm just going to give this window a title. So I'll say pygame.display.set underscore caption, and I will call this fighter. No, actually, let's call it brawler. Okay, so let's run this code and see what happens. Now it comes up saying that it's finished in half a second. So you did see something pop up very briefly and then disappear again. So the game window is being created. However, once the code runs from top to bottom, the code is essentially complete and Python is finished. So what I actually need to do is add in what's called the game loop. The game loop will allow the game to continuously run, take actions, draw the players and everything on the screen until I actually choose to exit. So this is going to be done with, first of all, declaring a variable and then setting up the loop based on that variable. So I'll add a comment here to say game loop and I'm going to create a variable called run. So first of all, I will set this variable to true and then add my while loop. So I'll say that while run, which is shorthand for saying while run is true, execute all the code below this. Now, if I was to run this just now, it would hang up because this run variable is going to be true. And so we're just going to be stuck inside this while loop eternally. So I need a way of now exiting this while loop. And for that, I'm going to add in an event. So we'll add a comment to say event handler. And I'm going to cycle through the available events by saying for event in pygame.event.get. And I'm going to be looking for a specific event at the moment. So I'll say if event.type is equal to pygame.quit, which is just when you click on the X in the top right corner of your screen or of this particular window that we're just about to create. Well, when that happens, I want to be kicked out of this while loop. I don't want us to continue running. Now I know that this while loop is running based on this variable run. So as long as this variable is set to true, this condition is going to be met and I'm going to be within this loop. So that means that if I want to exit the loop, I just need to change this variable from true to false. So let's just add that in here. We'll say run equals false. So now if I run this game again, now you can see the game window has come up. It's in the dimensions that I've specified and I can see the little title up here that I've just set as brawler. And now if I click the X up here, the game shuts down. Now just to tidy things up at the end, after we exit the while loop, I just want to quit Pygame. So I'll add a comment to say exit Pygame and we'll type pygame.quit. So right at the beginning, we had pygame.init, but then while, once the while loop is finished and we've essentially ended the game, I want to just have pygame.quit just to close everything out. So that's essentially it. That's the basics of the game loop. So the game loop is now set up. Now at the moment, all I've got is this black screen. So the next thing that I like to do is add in a background image. 
Now to do that, I'm going to go above my while loop. So you never want to be loading images within your game loop. You want to do all of that beforehand. So just here underneath where I've created my game window, I'm going to add a little comment to say load background image. I'm going to assign this to a variable called bg image, and I will use the function pygame.image.load. And here I just need to give the location of this file. Now this is where the folder structure is important. So from here, which is the root folder, this brawler tutorial, I'm going into the next folder down, assets, and then I'm going another folder down, which is images, then background, and there's background.jpg. So I need to make sure that I give it this correct location, otherwise it won't be able to find this file. So from the root folder, we go into assets, then it's images, then it's background, and then finally it's background.jpg. Now, if you run into any errors at this point that say that file cannot be found, then chances are it's something to do with this folder structure being a little bit different from what I've got set up here. So essentially, it's just not able to find the folder or the file in the location that you're saying here. So with that explained, I can now hide this panel on the left-hand side. We don't need it just now. And the last thing to add here is dot convert underscore alpha. Now, if I run this, nothing actually changes. So I still get a blank screen. Now, although I've loaded this background image into memory, I've not actually said to Pygame that I want this image to be drawn on the screen. So that's what's missing here. So what I will do is I will add a new function that I can then call within the game loop. So let's just go down here and define a new function. Add a comment to say a function for drawing background. And I'll say def for define draw underscore bg. Now this doesn't need to take any arguments, so I just leave these parentheses blank. And what I want to do now is draw this image onto my game window. Now the game window has been assigned to this variable here. If you remember when I first created my game window, I saved it to the variable screen. So that means I can just call that variable and I can say screen.blit my background image and then I need to give it the coordinates. So the image is going to be blitted in the top left corner of the screen. So the coordinates are 0, 0. Now the function is created, but it's not actually being called. So let's go into the main game loop. And right at the beginning as the first thing, we're just going to say draw background. And here I need to call that function, draw PG. Now let's run this again. And still nothing has changed. I'm still getting a blank screen, even though I'm calling this function. So what's going on here? So throughout this game loop, there's going to be a lot of different updates. So although I, all I've got at the moment is the background being drawn, I will eventually have players and they'll be moving around the screen and so on. So all of that stuff is going to be happening within this game loop. So what we need to do right at the end of it all, below the event handler, but still indented to make sure that it is part of this while loop, we need to call a function that's going to take all of those changes and it's going to update the display with them. So I'll add a comment to say update display and say pygame.display.update. And if I run this again, now I have a background. Now it doesn't look exactly like it did in the demo I showed. The reason for that is the size of the image. If I go back to this image, what we were just seeing there was just this screen or rather this top left corner rather than the whole thing. Now this image is bigger than my game window setting. So what I actually need to do is make sure that I resize it correctly so that it stretches to the size of my window. We go back into this draw background function and this time we create a new image. So I'll say scaled underscore BG for scaled background is equal to pygame.transform.scale. And this is going to scale my original background image to whatever sizes I want. Well, the size that I want in terms of width and height are already defined. They're my screen width and screen height. So I can just put them straight in here. Say screen width, screen height, and now, rather than blitting the original background image, I'm going to blit the scaled background. So if we run this again, now you can see it's taken the original image. It said, okay, well, the size is actually 1000 by 600. So we'll just resize it to fit that and blit the new image onto the screen. Now we can start working on the two fighters. So I go into this fighter.py file, and this is where I'm going to create all the functionality for them. I'll say, first of all, import pygame and then I will set up the fighter class. Now within your class, you always have to begin it with your constructor. So that's this init method. So we'll say define init, 
and always put the self argument first and then you have your x and the y coordinates as the next arguments there's going to be a lot more as we work on this fighter class but for now we just want to start simple and just make sure that we get these drawn on the screen first of all so rather than loading any images or anything like that i'm just going to use rectangles to begin with so i'll assign a rectangle to this constructor so i'll say self.rect is equal to pygame.rect with a capital r and this will create a new rectangle object now this is going to take a few arguments so the first two are the positions on the screen well that's those x and y arguments that i'm passing in here so the x and y coordinates are going to determine where this rectangle is drawn and then i need to give it a width and a height so i'm going to say 80 pixels wide and 180 pixels tall and for now that's it i'm just going to go back to my main file and now to access the functionality from this i need to make sure that i import it into my main file so up at the top where i'm importing pygame I also need to import this fighter class. So I'll say from fighter, which is the name of the Python file, import fighter with a capital F, because that's the name of the class. So we're basically saying that from this file, import this class here and all the functionality that comes with it. Now that I've imported this, I can go ahead and create instances of this class, just like I normally would if the code was in here. So underneath my functions, and just above my game loop, I'm going to create my two instances. So I'll say create two instances of fighters. And the first one is going to be called fighter underscore one. And it's going to be an instance of the fighter class. And the only arguments I need to give it are X and Y coordinates. So let's say 200 X and 310 Y. And we just copy this down and repeat it again for fighter two. So this one's going to be the same Y coordinate but it's going to be further over to the right hand side of the screen. So it will say 700 pixels. Now if I run this code, it executes fine. So I know that the, the two files are talking to each other correctly, but nothing is showing up on the screen. So I have created the instances of the fighters, but I'm not drawing them anywhere. So for that, I go back into this fighter class here and I add an additional method. So we'll say def draw and pass in the first argument is always self. And the second argument is going to be surface. So the surface is going to be essentially the game window that we're going to be drawing this fighter onto. For the time being, I don't actually have any images, but what I do have for each of the fighter classes is this rectangle. So I'm just going to draw a rectangle onto the screen to represent the players. So we'll say pygame.draw.rect. And where do I want to draw it onto? So that's going to be my surface. Then I need to give it a color. So we'll say 25500 for red. And then lastly, I want to give it the rectangle that's going to be drawn, which is self.rect. So the method is created, but now I need to make sure that I'm actually calling this draw method from my main game loop. So I'm going to come down here within the game loop, just underneath where I'm drawing my background. And I'm going to create a space and just add a comment to say draw fighters. And now we can call those instances. So it's going to be fighter one, and we can call the draw method. Now remember the draw method took an argument, which was the surface. Now in my case, my surface is called screen. So I'm going to pass a screen here as an argument, and then I can copy and paste this down for my second fighter. Now if we run this code, what I should get is a rectangle representing each of the fighters. So this part of it is working correctly. Now we can begin working on player controls and player movement. So I go back into my fighter class here, and just below the constructor, I'm going to create another method. This would be called uh, move so define move the only argument that it takes is self and first of all i just want to set a couple of variables here the first one is going to be speed so I'll set speed to 10 and this will just allow me to easily control how quickly the players move around the screen so if it's too slow or too fast i just come in and tweak this one variable next there's a couple more variables i need to define which are dx and dy and i will set both of these to zero so these variables are my delta variables, so they're the change. Basically, it's the change in the x-coordinate and a change in the y-coordinate. So because these are initially set to zero, it's just saying nothing is changing, so the position of the player is stationary. Next, I need to get key presses. So I'm going to save this in this variable key, and I can say key equals pygame.key.get underscore pressed. So whenever you press anything on the keyboard, it will register it within this variable here. And now I can look for movement key presses. So another comment to say movement. And here I can look through this key variable and look for 
particular keys being pressed. So movement left and right is going to be done by A and D. So I'm using WASD controls for player one and then the arrow keys for player two, but we'll come on to that in a minute. So to figure out which if these buttons have been pressed or not, all I do is say if key, and we'll say pygame.k, capital K, underscore, and then the letter or the key that you want to check. So in this case, I want to check for the letter A being pressed, so that's moving to the left. Well, if that's happened, then this dx variable, this delta x, is no longer zero. We're not stationary anymore. We're actually trying to move to the left. So moving to the left means that the x-coordinate needs to decrease and becomes a negative value. So I set my dx to negative speed. Then I can do the exact same thing here, just copy this down, but for moving to the right. So if I'm moving to the right, it's the D button that I'm looking for, and the DX variable just becomes speed. Now I can use this information to update the position of the rectangle. So right at the end of this move method, I'll just say update player position. So self.rect.x coordinate is changed by this DX variable. Then the same goes for the Y coordinate. Now, although I haven't actually added any jumping in, so the Y coordinate or DY isn't affected, I need to add this in later anyway, so I'm just gonna capture both of these at the same time. So the DX and the DY variables are used to update the rectangle's X and Y positions. Now, to make sure I can actually use this, I need to call this move method within the main game loop. So I go back here, I'm drawing my background. Before I draw the fighters, I'm gonna add a section to say, move fighters so again it's just going to be fighter underscore one and now i call the move method and then i take fighter underscore two and i call the move method on that as well so if i run this again i can now move the players notice though both of them move together so we will address that in a second but first of all you can see that the movement is working one thing however is that the movement is very quick so although i'm just pressing it very lightly for just a second they're very quickly moving across the screen and the reason for that is that i have not capped the frame rate of this game so right now it's basically just running as fast as the computer can run it and because it's so simple right now and there's not really a lot going on well it's, it's running it a little bit too fast so before we go any further i just want to cap the frame rate so to do that we go up to the top here and just underneath where i've created my game window and before I start loading the images, I'll just have another little section where I had a comment to say set frame rate. And to do that, I first define a clock variable, which will be pygame.time.clock. And then I define a variable for my frame rate. So this will be set to 60 frames per second. Now I can go into my main game loop again down here. And the very first thing I do before I even draw the background is I just say clock, which I've just created, dot tick at the rate of FPS. So if I run this again and move around, now you can see it's a lot smoother and I can actually control them properly. So now the frame rate is capped at 60 frames per second, so the game is running a little bit better. So at the moment, I move both of the players simultaneously. So before I add in player two's controls, I'm, I'm wanting to complete player one's controls because then I can just copy and paste them and tweak them. So I'm just gonna comment out fighter two move. This way, fighter two just stays where he is and I can move this rectangle around instead. So there's a few things to fix. So for example, I can go off the screen at the moment. So let's fix that first of all. To do that, we go back into this fighter class and into the move method. So I'm gonna be adding a little bit more functionality to it here. Now, first of all, I'm getting the movement from the, arrow, uh, from the A and D keys. And then I'm just straight away updating the rectangle's position based on those variables. So I'm not taking into account the fact that I might be close to the edge of the screen. So before I actually update these coordinates, I want to check will updating them and moving the player result in me going off the screen. Well, let's add a comment to say ensure player stays on screen. So first of all, let's look at the left hand side. So we'll say if self.rect.left, so if the left hand side of the rectangle as it is at the moment, plus this dx variable, if I combine those two variables together, I, if I then go off the screen, meaning that if that coordinate is less than zero, well, that means that I don't want to move all that far. So let's say that, for example, at the moment, my left-hand side of the rectangle is an x-coordinate five, and my dx variable, because I'm trying to move to the left, is negative speed, which is 10. Well, five minus 10 is going to give me a negative value. So the player is going to go off the screen. If that's the case, then I want to change this dx variable. Rather than being minus 10, 
I just want it to be whatever the distance is between the edge of the screen and the left hand side of the rectangle. So the edge of the screen is a coordinate zero and the left hand side of the rectangle is self.rect.left. Well, you'll know that this is basically the same as just saying minus self.rect.left. So rather than being able to go off the side of the screen, it's just going to go as far as the edge and then stop there. So let's run this and see what happens. And there we go. So I can go that far, but then I can't keep going off the edge of the screen. So I fixed the left hand side, but now we need to fix the right hand side. Now the logic here is going to be the same. Instead of looking at the left hand side of the player, we're looking at the right hand side. So if we say if self.rect.right plus the dx variable, if that is greater than the edge of the screen, then we want to stop. But what is the edge of the screen? Well, this is defined by these two variables here, or rather this one variable here, my screen width. So I say that if that is bigger than screen width, now note I'm not using capitals here, and I'll explain why in a second, but if this is greater than screen width, then that means that I'm going to be going off the right hand side of the screen. So I need to make sure that my dx variable is reset to just the gap between the screen width and the right hand side of the player. Now some of you might notice that this will give me an error and this won't work. The reason is the screen width variable is not defined within this file here. It's defined here as an initial constant. So what I need to do is pass this variable into the move method. So in here, I put in screen width. In fact, I'm going to delete this one because as I develop it, I'll just be able to copy and paste it at the end. So now I take an additional argument within this move method. So rather than just having self, I also take screen width. So that's why I just typed it in small letters here rather than capitals. If I run this again, I can now move to the left and I stop there and I move to the right and I stop there as well. So that's it. The player is now restricted to the screen. Next, let's add in some jumping for the player. So we go back into this fighter class. And for this, I need to add another variable to my constructor. So underneath this rectangle, I'm going to add another one called self.vel underscore y. And this is my y velocity. So although I have this dy variable, which is just how much I want to move the player up and down by, I also want to have this velocity so I know how fast the player is moving up and down. So it's going to get a little bit confusing at first because I have two variables to control the vertical position, but it'll make sense as I start to add them in. So now under this movement section here, I will add another comment to say jumping or just jump. And the key I'm looking for here is the W key. So if key pygame.k underscore W has been pressed, then we set that Y velocity underscore Y to negative 30. So this has to be a negative value because negative in the Y direction moves up the way. I made a little typo there, val y. So now underneath this, in a separate little section, I'm going to update my dy variable. So dy is increased by self.val underscore y. So now you can see this is essentially quite similar to this speed variable. It's just that the speed variable I was only using for the x coordinate because moving left and right as a fixed speed but this y variable is going to be changing because it's going to be faster when it first jumps and it's going to slow down as gravity takes over. So if I run this again, uh, the main code again, uh, what have I done here? I must have made a typo somewhere within the code. Oh, I haven't defined it as anything. So I need to define this as zero when I first set it up. So the starting velocity up the way is zero. Now if I run this again, I shouldn't get any errors. So if I press W now, it jumps. So the player jumps and just goes completely off the screen and that's him gone. If I do it again, there we go. So the Y velocity is working. The player is now jumping. The problem is there's nothing bringing him back down. Now what should bring back down is gravity. So gravity is going to be an additional variable that I'm going to put into this move method to act in the opposite direction. Make sure that when he jumps, he actually comes back down. So let's define this variable just underneath speed. I will say gravity is equal to, let's say two. Now I need to actually apply this gravity variable. So I go down here where I've got this dy variable being updated based on the y velocity, and I'm actually going to create a little section here for it. So I'll add a comment to say apply gravity. And before I go ahead and update the y coordinate, I'm going to tweak this y velocity. So I will say that self.val underscore y 
is increased by the gravity variable. So essentially, this y velocity is always going to be brought back down because of gravity. So if I run this again, you'll notice straight away it just falls off the screen. So if I start hitting W, I can actually keep him jumping up and down here. So that is enough to bring the player back on the screen, but as soon as I stop pressing it, he's just going to fall and go completely off. So that means that the third check I need to add, as well as going left off the screen and right off the screen, is the bottom of it. I need to make sure that it doesn't fall through this ground here. So we go back into the fighter class, and the section where I say ensure the player stays on the screen, well, so far we looked at left and right, so let's take care of the up and down as well. Now the logic is going to be the same again, it's just I'm looking for the bottom of the rectangle now. So if I say rect.bottom plus dy, so if we increase it by this dy variable, is that going to go off the bottom of this floor? Well the floor is not the entirety of the screen, so I'll say screen height minus 110 pixels. So I don't actually want it to go right up to the bottom of the screen because there's a little ground or a little bit of a floor within this background image and it takes up about 110 pixels of this game window. So if we reach this point and we're about to go off the bottom of that floor, then first of all, I want to make sure that my Y velocity is just set to zero so that I can't keep moving. And then I set my DY variable, just as I did with the DX variable, to the difference between screen height minus 110 pixels. So the difference between the floor and the bottom of the rectangle. Now let's go back into the main code, run this again, and ah, of course, now the screen height variable here is another variable that is not available to this section of code unless I pass it through as an argument. So we need to make sure that I do that here. I add in screen height as a second argument, and within my move method, I call screen height. Okay, run that again, and there we go. So the player is now sitting on this floor. So this is what I meant by 110 pixels. So this floor here is 110 pixels and it makes sure that the player is always sitting on top of it. So if I jump, he'll hop up and he'll come straight back down and land back onto this floor again. He won't go through it. Now that's working fine, but what if I keep pressing W? Well, he can just keep going. So essentially this W is giving me double jump. I don't want to be able to do that. I want to be able to jump once and then only jump again when the player comes back down to the earth. If I just hold W, he just goes away off the screen. So to overcome that, I'm going to add a trigger. So this trigger is going to be, first of all, added within the constructor. Now if we go to this y velocity variable, just underneath that, I will say self.jump is equal to false. So when we first create the instance of this fighter, he's not jumping. He's not in a jumping state, so this variable is false. I can then go to my jump section down here and add an additional check to this if statement. So first of all, we're saying if the W key has been pressed, then we jump. Well, that's fine, but I also want to be able to only do that if the key has been pressed and I'm not currently jumping. So this is what's going to avoid this double jump and continuous jump. So we'll add an AND statement here. I'm going to say AND self.jump is false. So as long as we're not currently jumping, then we can press the W key and we can jump. Well, as soon as we have done this, well, we have just jumped. So that means that this self.jump variable needs to be set back to true. If I go back here again, run it, press W, I jump, but now I can't do it anymore. I can't keep jumping. So it did work the first time, it stopped me double jumping, but now I'm glued to the ground. And that's because this jump variable is never reset. So we initially start with it set to false, but that's only when we run this init method, when we first create an instance. That variable is never reset back to false again. So what I need to do is come down to this section where I'm making sure that the player stays on the screen and I'm checking the underside of the rectangle. If he does hit the ground again, so he jumped and he's back down again, the y velocity is zero. Well, he's no longer jumping either. So the jump variable becomes false. Now we go back here and press W and there we go. Now I can just keep jumping and I can keep pressing W, but he will only jump that one time and he'll jump again once he hits the ground. Now at this point, you're probably sick of working with these rectangles and you want to start adding in some images. Now before we get into that though, I want to add in some of the fighting mechanics. So to start off, I will look at adding in some attacking. Now if we go back to this fighter class, we've got our move section here, which allows me to move left and right as well as jump. Now within here, I'm going to take some more key presses and this is going to be my attacks. So I'll add a comment here to say attack. 
and I'm going to look for key prices. Now, the players will actually have two different attacks. So you can decide if you want the attacks to do different amounts of damage, but I just use it for the different attack animations just to kind of add a little bit of variability into the game. So we'll say if key pygame.k underscore. Now I've used R and T for my two attacks for player one. So if it's either R or key is pygame.k underscore T, if either one of those buttons has been pressed, then an attack has been initiated. So I will call a method for attacking the opposition player. But before I do that, I want to know which of these keys has been pressed. So right now I'm just saying if one or the other has been pressed. Well, I'm going to add an additional if statement inside here. So first of all, the comment to say determine which attack type was used. And I would say if, and again, looking at the key presses here. So if key pygame.k underscore R has been pressed, then it's going to be attack type one. So we'll say self attack type is equal to one. And just repeat this again for my second attack. So if I press T, then attack type is two. Now you'll notice I haven't declared these variables yet. So I need to make sure that I do that up here. So underneath self.jump, I will say self.attack type, and I will set this to zero to begin with. Now to actually initiate the attack from this point, now you'll notice I've left this line blank. I'm going to call an attack method. So first I need to create this method. I've got my move method and I've got my draw method. So between the two of them, I will make a new method called attack. So I'll say define attack. We'll take this argument of self for now. It will take a couple more, but I'll just leave them for the time being. Now at this point, we need to figure out how we actually handle these attacks. So if I just put a pass in here for the time being, so I can run this code. Now I can move the player left and right, but how is he going to be able to determine when an attack has been thrown, whether that attack has hit the opposing enemy? Now I can press R and T just now, nothing happens, but I know that it's registering them in the background. So what I'm going to do essentially is because both of these fighters are going to be using either a sword or a staff or some kind of melee weapon, well, it means that I can just check whether the opponent is close enough within range to be hit. So I will create an attacking rectangle that's going to go in front of the player every time he attacks, and I will check for collusion between this attacking rectangle and the enemy to see if the attack has connected. So that's the logic of it, but I'll build it up in steps to demonstrate how it looks. So let's go back into the attack method first of all, and let's create this attacking rectangle. So we'll say attacking underscore rect is equal to a pi game rectangle. So note that the R here starts with a capital R. So this rectangle is going to need four variables. It will need the X and Y coordinates and then the width and the height. So the X and Y coordinates are going to be the player that's throwing the attack. So I can say that the X coordinate is self.rect.x. No, actually not X, it will be center X because I want it to be thrown from the middle of the player. So center X is the X coordinate, self.rect.y is the Y coordinate. And then for the width and height, I can choose how far I want the attack to be thrown. So I'm just going to say two times self.rect.width. So the attack is going to be two times as wide as the player currently is. And uh, for the height, it'll be self.rect.height. So that's going to create the rectangle for me. Now, before I, uh, I go too much further, let's actually see what this looks like. So let's draw this rectangle on the screen. We'll say pygame.draw.rect. Now I'm going to have to do the same thing here with this surface. So I'll need to add that in as an argument. So I'll say surface. We'll change the color of this to uh, RGB. So it's 0, 255, and then the rectangle is going to be attacking underscore rect. So let's just make sure that to avoid any errors, I pass this surface argument into this method. And now I can actually call this attack method. So the moment is just sitting there. It exists, but it's not being called anywhere. So within this attacking section, I need to make sure that I call that method. So we'll say self.attack. And of course, it needs to take this variable, which is uh, the, the display surface, the screen. So I need to pass that in here. But of course, the move method itself also doesn't have this, art, this variable in it. So it's, it's a little bit messy, but it's just temporary. So we'll put the surface argument into here, but we also need to pass it into the move method to begin with. So we'll just tack it onto the end for now, 
and then we can come back and clean it up once all this works. So here we just add a screen. So this is going to be the surface that gets passed through. If I run this again and I press R, then you can see what I was talking about. You can see this rectangle is now appearing. So this is the attack rectangle. And if I press T, the exact same thing happens. So the logic here, like I was saying, is that if I'm close enough, like right now, I'm too far away. So this attack won't register. But if I'm about here and I throw an attack, well, then the enemy is within range. So at this point, I should be able to check for collision between the enemy and this green area here. And as soon as the green area and the enemy collide, well, that means that there's been a successful attack. And so the enemy will take damage. So now let's test this attack out. So I know that I'm creating this attack rectangle here, but I'm not actually doing anything with it yet. So let's just check for that collision. Now I'll keep this draw rectangle underneath because I know it's temporary. So it'll just be a reminder to delete it afterwards. So let's check for this collision. We'll say if attack or attacking underscore rect dot collide rect. So essentially this is saying check for rectangular collision between this rectangle and another rectangle. So what's the other rectangle? Well, that's going to be the enemy. Now this attack method is going to, to, to apply to either of the two fighters. So for each one of them, the opposite fighter is the enemy. So that means that this enemy is going to change depending on which player is being controlled right now. So I need to just add a generic variable here, which is going to be my target. So we'll say target, and I need to check for rectangle collision, meaning that it needs to be targets rectangle. So target dot rect. Well, what is this target? The target is something that I need to feed through as an additional argument. So next to surface, we're going to add target. Then up in the move method up here, where we're calling this attack in the first place, we add in this target variable. Uh, but of course, this target doesn't exist here either. So that's another argument that I need to pass in within the move method. So we'll say target as an argument here. And now when I call the move method from my main game loop, which is here, I can add the target as an argument. So for fighter one, the target is going to be the other fighter. So it's going to be fighter two. And that means that when I later on come back and I call this same code for fighter two, the target here is going to be switched over to fighter one. So each fighter has the opposite fighter as its target. Now let's just go back down here and continue with this. So if that collision has been detected, well, for now, I don't really want to do anything else. I just want to confirm that it's happened. So let's just print hit. Let's see if this runs. And I'll go over and I'll do an attack, first of all, where I know it's going to miss. So it's missing here. I come over and I attack him again. And now you see we're detecting collision and it's giving me these hits. So if I go over here, nothing's happening. Come closer and I'm getting a whole bunch of hits. So I know that the collision is working, so that's great. But if you notice, this is happening constantly. So if I scroll up, I'm getting loads and loads of these hits because as long as I hold the R button, it's just going to keep creating this rectangle and keep checking this collision. So if this enemy had a health variable and I was saying every time there's a collision, take 10 off their health, well, their health would be gone within a second. So actually what I want to do is make sure that this attack, just like jumping, is not happening all the time. So I need to add some kind of trigger to make sure that I can only attack once, then wait a second, then attack again, so that you can't just sit there and hold the R key and just destroy everything in your path. So we need an additional variable. Now we go back into this fighter class and right at the top where I've got this attack type, well, just before that, I'm gonna add another variable, which is going to be self.attacking. And I'll start off by setting this to false. So this will be a trigger just like my jump trigger. Now we go down into this movement section and this is where I've got my attacks. Now you could think it'll be exactly the same as I did with the jumping and I will just add it as an extra check here. But actually, I don't want to be able to do any of these movements if there's currently uh, an attack. So for example, I don't want to be able to attack again if I've already attacked, but I also don't want to be able to jump or move. So the idea is that once you start to attack, essentially you're swinging the sword or you're moving the club or something like that, you're in an action already. So you don't want to be able to start an attack and then also run away at the same time. So all of this movement is going to be wrapped up within that same trigger. So what I'll do is before I even start this section, I will add another comment just to say, can only perform other actions if not currently attacking. And here we can say if self.attacking is false, 
well, then all of this is fine. I can do all of these things as long as I'm not currently attacking. But as soon as I've thrown an attack, I can't do any of this stuff again until the attack is complete. So then let's go down to the attack method down here. And as soon as we've thrown the attack, so it doesn't actually matter if I've hit the enemy or not, the fact that I've thrown an attack is enough to basically say that I'm now attacking. So I set that trigger, this self.attacking, to true. Now if I run this code again, and I run over to the enemy and I try to attack. So you, you notice it flashed up for a second, this little green rectangle, and then I've recorded a hit. But now nothing else is happening. I can keep pressing R, but I can't attack again. And if, even if I held R, if I run this again, I just hold the R key, it only flashes up for a second. So I'm still holding it now, but nothing else is happening. So I can see that the trigger is working correctly. The only thing left then is to actually reset it once the attack is complete. But I'm not going to do that just yet. I'll come back to that shortly and explain why. What I would like to do instead, first of all, is improve this section here. So right now, when I do get a successful attack, it just says hit. So I display... The, the fact that I've made this attack and it's landed and it says hit. What I actually want to do is add in health for the enemy and for both players actually, so that when I do throw a successful attack, I can see the player's health dropping. Now doing that is quite straightforward. I can just go back into my constructor and just underneath all of this stuff, I'll say self.health is equal to 100. So both of the players will start off with 100 health. Now, when we get a successful attack, rather than printing hit onto the, uh, the console, we're going to change this and instead we're going to take the target. So remember, target is what we're feeding here as an argument for the opponent each time. Well, the target's health is going to drop by 10. So whenever we hit one of the other enemies, the opposite one loses 10 health. So that's, that's all good, but it would be nice if I could actually visualize this on the screen. Right now, this variable is just stored within each of the individual instances of the fighter class. I would like to create health bars to be able to show the player's health on the screen instead. So to do that, I go back to my main game, so my main.py file, and underneath my draw background function, I will create another fairly simple function to be able to draw these two health bars. So I'll add a comment to say function for drawing fighter health bars. And I'll say define draw underscore health underscore bar. So this needs to take a few variables. First of all is the health, so how much health the player still has. Then the x and the y coordinates where I want to draw these two health bars. Now the health bar is just going to be a rectangle. So let's draw a rectangle on the screen. We'll say pygame.draw.rect and the target is going to be the screen. Now the color I want to use, I'll have to go up and define these colors in a second, but I'm just gonna type yellow in here. And then the rectangle itself is going to be a coordinates X and Y, which are those two arguments in the function above. And then the width and the height, well, I'll say 400 pixels and 30 pixels. Okay, so now let's just go and define this color up above in here, first of all. So I'll just add a little section up here because I'll have a few different colors to define. So I'll say define colors. And so yellow, I just called up as 255, 255, zero. I guess I could do a couple more while I'm here. So let's say red is 255, zero, zero. And I will also need white. So we'll say white is 255, 255, 255. So that's my colors defined. And I've got the beginnings of my health bar function here. So now what's left is to actually call this function within my main game loop. So just underneath my background, I'll add a comment to say show player health. Or rather, let's say show player stats. So we call the function draw health bar, and then I need to give it those arguments. So the first one is going to be the health. Well, I can say fighter1.health because that's now an instance variable. And the coordinates are going to be 20 and 20, so that's the x and y. And we can do the same thing for my second fighter, so fighter 2, but his coordinate, on the x-coordinate anyway, is going to be moved over to 580. Okay, so let's run this again. And you can see now I've got these two health bars. So if I go and attack this enemy, nothing changes. Now the reason for that is because I've basically just drawn a solid yellow rectangle. So this rectangle, no matter what the health, is always going to be 400 pixels across. 
what I need to do instead is reduce the width of this rectangle as the enemy's health drops. So I know the health that a player starts with, it's 100, and I know the health that they have now. So I can just work out a little ratio here, which will be ratio is equal to the current health, which is given in this variable here, this argument, and the original health, which is 100, if I spell it correctly. So now rather than making it a fixed 400 pixels wide, I can say 400 multiplied by the ratio. Now, if, for example, the current health is 50, then you would say that he's got half of his health, right? Because he started off with 100 health, now he's got 50 health, so he's down to half health. This ratio should be 0 0.5, which means that the rectangle, instead of being 400 pixels wide, it will be 200 pixels wide. So that will show that it's half of his health. So if I run this again, run over and attack him, this time you notice it dropped. So it did work, the rectangle's width decreased, and it's registered the fact that he's lost some health. It's kind of hard to tell though, because there's nothing else underneath it, you just see the background. So what I want to do is actually layer two rectangles on top of each other. So we go back here, and before we draw the yellow one, we're going to draw a red one underneath it. So I'll say pygame.draw.rect, and again, I'll be onto the screen. Now the color this time is going to be red. The coordinates are going to be X, Y, and this time it is going to be fixed. So this one doesn't change. I run it again. So you can't see the red one, but it's there underneath the yellow one. So if I do an attack here, now you can see I've taken damage and it's showing that I've actually taken damage because the right rectangle is being drawn underneath and this part of it is now revealed. So this looks a lot better now and it's given me some proper health bar rectangles. Just to make it a little bit nicer, I'd like to add a white outline to it. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. I'm going to just do it the lazy way. I will draw another rectangle underneath. So in fact, I'll, rather than just typing it out again, I will copy the one from here. So I will draw a white rectangle underneath all of these ones, but I will offset it. So I'll offset it by one pixel to the left and up the way. And then I will make it two pixels wider and two pixels taller than the rest. So this will actually give me an except I think I've done something wrong or it's maybe just very very faint let's just to amplify it let's go for five pixels all round let's see yeah okay it's there it was just very faint so maybe one pixel is a little bit uh, a little bit too light we'll go with something like that Okay, yeah, that's a little bit better. So now I've got this outline, and if I attack this guy, you can now see it a little bit clearer because there's some red here as well, so there's a bit more contrast. Okay, so this is starting to come together now, and we've got the mechanics sort of working within it. There is, however, one issue that may not have been obvious so far. So when I'm over here and I throw an attack, it's fine. You can see it flashing up for a second on the right-hand side of the player. But what if this player is over here? What if I'm to the right of the enemy and I throw an attack? Well, the attack still comes up on the right-hand side. So I need to be able to tell which way each player is relative to the other one. They need to always be looking at each other. You can't tell that here, of course, because both of these rectangles are just rectangles. So you can't know which way they're facing. But when we've got images in here and when they've got the attack rectangle, we need to make sure that they're always looking at each other. So I need to add another bit of logic that looks at where each player is and looks which one is to the left of the other and which one is to the right of the other. So we go back into this fighter class and add another variable. And I'm actually going to do it right at the top. So before my rectangle even, I'm going to add a variable called self.flip and I'll begin by setting this to false. Now within my move method further down, I've got my section where I check that the player stays on the screen. Well, just below that, I will add another little section, which is going to say ensure players ensure players face each other. And this will be a fairly simple check. So I already know the X coordinate of the current player because that's going to be whatever self.rect is. And I also am passing in the target. So I'm always passing in the opponent to each of the fighters. So I can just compare their X positions. I can say if target.rect.center X is greater than self.rect.centerx. So basically, if the target is over to the right-hand side of where this player is, well, then we don't need to flip because we're already facing to the right-hand side. So self.flip remains false. Otherwise, we need to flip around. So we'll say self.flip becomes true. 
So if I have, and once I do have images loaded in, this variable is going to control which way these are facing. So that's fine. I now know whether the player is going to be flipped or not. However, I can now use this variable within my attack method. So this attacking rectangle that I'm creating is being created at the center of the fighter. Now that's fine if I'm looking to the right hand side, but if I'm facing to the left, I need to take that exact same rectangle and I just need to shift it to the left by the width of itself. So essentially I just add in here minus two times self dot rect dot width multiplied by self dot flip. So when self dot flip is equal to false, this section is just going to zero out. So this won't apply. But if self dot flip is equal to true, that means that I'm facing to the left and that's going to offset my attacking rectangle by this amount. So if I was to go back and run this again, uh, what have I done here? Uh, I've missed off an X here, made a little typo. So go back again, run this. So if I run over to this side and I attack, attack is fine, still appears in front. And if I go over to the other side and attack again, now you notice the attack comes in on the left-hand side. So I know that the rectangles are now flipping to face the direction of the enemy and they're throwing the attacks in the correct orientation. So now that the fighting mechanics are most of the way there, we can finally get onto the graphics. So I'm going to use sprite sheets to be able to add in the individual images and the animations for the, both of the players. So I'll just show you how this is currently structured. Now within my core folder or my root folder, I had the assets folder and in there I've got images. So aside from the background and icons, I've got the warrior and wizard. That's the two fighters that I'm going to be using. Now each one of these, when I go into it, is split up into a bunch of individual sprite sheets. So the attack sprite sheet, for example, has got all of these different frames that when you quickly show them one after another, give the impression of an animation. What I've done, however, rather than having all of these individual files is I've just combined all of them into one big sheet. So for the warrior, I've just got one sheet that's got all of the actions and all the different frames alongside it. So the plan here is that I'm going to load this image in and then I'll be able to extract each of these squares as one individual image and I can store them all within a Python list. So that's how the animation here is going to be structured. Then by simply flicking through them really quickly and just showing them one after another after another, I'm going to be able to create this animation. So let's get into that then. First of all, let's load these images in. So we go here, I've got my background image loaded already. So just underneath, I will add another comment to say load sprite sheets. And I'll load them both in at the same time. So warrior underscore sheet is equal to pygame.image.load. So remember the location here is very important. So I'm going, this is my root folder. So I'm going into assets, images, warrior, sprites, warrior.png. So it's assets, images, warrior, sprites, warrior.png. And then at the end, we just add convert alpha. And now we can copy this paste it down and I just want to change warrior to wizard and change warrior to wizard here as well. Okay, so that's both of the sprite sheets loaded in. Let's just run this and make sure there's no errors and there is an error straight away. So what have I done wrong here? It says that the file has not been found there. So, uh, oh, of course, uh, it's the wrong folder. So I should have changed this. So that's an example of the kind of error that you, you would get if there was any issues with the location or the file name or anything like that. So run this again. Okay, that's fine. So the images obviously aren't shown, but I know that I'm loading them in correctly because I've not thrown any errors. So both of the sprite sheets are now in the game's memory. And there's another thing that's important to these sprite sheets, and that's the number of individual frames each of the animations has. So if I open this up again, you can see that this first one, it might not be obvious, but I know that this is the idle animation and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten frames. So this one has ten frames, but the rest don't all have the same number. So I actually need to know how many frames each of the animations has to be able to know how many of them to extract. So for that, I'm going to create a couple of lists. So underneath all my spreadsheet loading, I will add another comment to say, define number of steps in each animation. 
So the warrior animation steps is going to be a Python list and it's just going to be a list of numbers. And these numbers are going to be the number of frames. So I've already counted them all up, so I know what they are. So it's 10, 8, 1, 7, 7, 3, 7. And then I do the exact same thing again for the wizard. So I say wizard animation steps is equal to, so he's got a little bit less actually, 8, 8, 1, 8, 8, 3, 7. Okay, yeah, less idle, but then more, I think these might be attacks. So it's kind of a, a bit of a mixture. So that's why I had to use different lists for each animation type because they have different numbers of frames. Okay, good. So I've loaded the sprite sheets into memory. I've created these lists, but now I need to pass all that information into my fighter class. So when I create these instances, I've got my fighters at the X and Y coordinates. I need to add additional arguments in here. So the first one is going to be the sprite sheet. So fighter one is the warrior. So we'll say warrior sheet add warrior animation steps. And then the second one is the wizard. So it's wizard sheets or wizard sheet and it's wizard animation steps. So now we go over to the fighter class. I'll just hide that panel. And then we need to receive this information and we need to process it. So I'm going to create a new method up here. So just below the constructor, I will create a new method called load images. And it takes the argument of self and then the sprite sheet and animation steps. So we had a little comment here to say extract images from a sprite sheet. And I'll try to build this up in stages from the bottom up because there's quite a few things going on at the same time here. So first of all, if I bring up this animation sprite sheet here, what I want to do is move through, if we ignore all the rows and I just look at row one, which is the idle animation, I just want to move through each of the frames and I want to extract a little rectangle like that. So I want to take this one, add it to a list. Then I need to move on to the next one, take that one, add it to the same list. And over time, once I've gone through all of them, I build up a list that's got the entire animation sequence for idle. So let's just do that with a for loop. Whenever you're doing something repetitive like that, you can just use a for loop. So I'll say for underscore. Now this means that I'm not really bothered about the variable. So it's just an iterator for me. In range animation. So for each animation, we want to grab a temporary image. So this temporary image is going to be sprite sheet. So this entire sprite sheet that I'm passing through dot sub surface. So I don't want the whole sprite sheet. I just want to take a little square like I just showed. And then I need to define the X and Y coordinates of this subsurface and the width and height. Well, this first little square, this first one that I want here is going to start at zero, zero, and it's going to go across by the width and the height of the image. Now I can't take the image of the sprite sheet because that's too big. That's the entirety. So I actually need to define a variable that's going to determine how big each of these squares or each of these frames in the sprite sheet actually are. So we need to go back to the main.py file and within here actually create a little area where I define some information and some data about the warrior and the wizard sprite sheets. So just below the colors here, I will add a section to say define fighter variables. And for now, I think I just need the one to start with. I don't want to add too much at once. So say warrior size is 162 pixels. Now I know that that's how big each of the squares it actually is. It's 162 by 162. I simply extracted that from the individual sprite sheets. So I know that that's how big when the artist drew these, that's just how big they made the individual frames. And in fact, you can kind of see that at the bottom, right? The image is 1620 wide. There's 10 frames here. So 1620 divided by 10, it's 162. So that's how I know that each of these squares is 162 pixels wide and tall. So I can define that number here. And I can do the same thing for the wizard while I'm at it. So I'll say wizard size is actually bigger. So they're not the same. And this one is 250 pixels. Now over time, I am going to come back and add more of these individual things in here. But for now, I don't want to overload it. So what I'm going to do is create a list called warrior data. And for now, this list is only going to contain one thing, which is the warrior size. Later on, as we add more information, this list will grow. But for now, it's just the one thing. So it might seem a little bit silly why I'm creating a list of one item, but that's, that's the reason. So wizard data is 
that list which just contains the wizard size for now so now if we go back down to where I am creating the instances of the fighters, before I pass in sprite sheets, I will pass in that data. So I'll pass in warrior data and wizard data. And the reason I've kind of compressed it all or combined them into a list is so that I just pass in one thing because otherwise this, as I add more and more things to this line, uh, this is just going to get really long. So warrior data and wizard data will store a few different things over time. So for now, that's going to give me the sizes. So they're going to come in through this constructor method here. So I just need to add the arguments in here to capture them. So after X and Y, we had data. So that's that warrior or wizard data. We also had the sprite sheet being passed in and the animation steps. So we can extract this information and store it within these self variables here. So the first one we can say is self.size is equal to data. Remember that data was was a list. So if I just go to index zero, that's going to give me the first and at the moment the only item, which is the size of the image. So now I can go back to this load images method and continue developing it. So where we left off was that I had this uh, iterator here that's going through each of the steps in a given animation. So this variable will change eventually, but for now, let's just assume that it's the first animation. So it's the idle animation. So it's going to go over 10 steps. And it's going to take a little square out of it. It's going to take this temporary image of a subsurface. Now, I want this to start at 0, 0, and I want it to be size, uh, sorry, self.size width and self.size height because I know that it's, uh, have I done this correctly? Self.size for both, yes, of course, because that variable is the same for both width and height as a square. So it's going to be 162 pixels wide and 162 pixels tall in the case of the warrior, and it'll be 250 and 250 in the case of the wizard. Okay, so that's fine. It's extracted the image, but now I need to store that image into a list. So before I even get into that loop, I'm going to create a temporary image list, and I'll set that to an empty list. So once I extract the image, I can store it into my list. I can say temp image dot underscore list dot append and what am I appending? Well, it's just that temporary image that I just pulled out. So by the end of this for loop, I will have gone through each of these 10 images. I will pull out a rectangle from each one and I will create a list out of it. However, you might have noticed a little problem here, which is that I'm starting each of these subsurfaces, each of these little squares at coordinates 0, 0. So actually all 10 of my images are going to just be this first slide here. What I need to do is change the X coordinate with each iteration of the loop. So what I need to do is actually change this x, oh sorry, this yeah, x variable with each iteration. So rather than having this underscore here, which meant that I didn't care about the iterable, I actually want to add a variable here. So I'm going to say for x in the range of animation, I want to take this temporary image at the coordinate of x multiplied by self dot size. So now it's going to move along the row because at each iteration the x variable increases, so it moves us onto the next square along. So that's going to get us halfway there. That's going to extract one individual row. So we'll get the first one and then we're done because the for loop ends after we've done the first animation. So what I now need to do is expand that for loop so that once we go through all the X values in, in the first row, we then move on to the next one and the next one and the next one. So we actually need to move down the way as well as across the way. So I'm going to nest this individual for loop that I've already got at the moment inside another for loop. So up here, we're going to say for animation in animation steps. So remember, animation steps is the list that I previously passed through. So animation steps tells me how many frames are in each sequence of the animation. So 10 in idle, 8 in whatever the next one is, and so on. So now if I just indent all of this, it means that I'm going to be iterating through that, and I will be repeating this process for, for the row in the animation list. However, the problem is that when I take these rectangles with this section here, remember this subsurface, I have added in a variable for the X coordinate, but not for the Y. So this is still being taken from the top. So I need to add something similar to this for going vertically up and down the sprite sheet. And that's going to come from this first for loop because the nested for loop, the one inside, goes left and right. This for loop is the one that's going to control each of the animations. So it's going to move down through the list. So what we're going to do here is add a second variable to the for loop. We'll say for y, comma, animation in, enumerate 
the animation steps. So essentially now it splits the for loop into two. So animation is going to be each of the animation steps and that's going to be fed into my next for loop. But this y variable is going to be tied to enumerate. And enumerate basically just means it ignores the data that's inside it. And it just is kind of like having a tracker, something that tracks how many times we've run through this animation. So it's going to start off at zero. And then every time we go through this for loop, this y variable is going to increase by one. So if I wanted to, instead of this, I could do something like just keep it as it is without the enumerate and just have y equals zero. And then each time the animation is complete, I say y is increased by one. So I could do that. Uh, this is just a neater way of doing the same process. So we add, oops, we add y in here and we enumerate this section. So now that I have a y variable for moving down the list, I need to add that in here. So instead of my zero, I say y multiplied by self dot size. Now the last thing that's left to do is have a master animation list. So right now I've got this temporary image list and this essentially just extracts the images in the row. But once that's done, it moves on to the next row and it overrides it. So it, it empties the list and it rewrites all of that in. So I need to have one overall list that's going to track all the animations going across the way as well as going down the way. So right at the beginning here, I will create another list called animation list and it will be an empty list. So that by the end of each of these for loops, so when this linear for loop is done, then I take my overall animation list and I append the temporary list into it. So you need to make sure the indentation here is exactly as I've got it here. So this for loop, the one that's nested, is completed for one run. It produces a finalized temporary image list. And when, it, when that's done, that's essentially saying that that image list will have one row's worth of images inside it. So we take that one row's worth of images, we add it in the next line into the master animation list, and then we repeat the process, but we move down one row. So then we move on to the next one, grab all of these images, add it to the master animation list, move on to the next line. So by the end of it, I have one master list that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows containing, or rather seven individual lists containing each of their animation steps. So of course, once all this is done, I need to actually get this information back out. So we close this method. So just unindent that correctly by saying return the animation list. So finally, I need to actually call this method. So I've created it, but I'm not calling it anywhere. And I'm going to call it from the constructor itself. So as soon as I create a fighter, whether it's the warrior or the wizard, I call this method on it to make sure that I create this animation list on it. So let's say underneath this flip, we'll say self dot animation list is equal to self dot load underscore images. And then I can give it the arguments that it needs. So sprite sheet, so basically take the sprite sheet, take the number of animation steps, and then give me back a list that contains all of that information. So I hope that made sense. It's a tricky concept to explain, uh, but let's see if we can actually run it and if, if it works first time or if I'll get an error. Okay, so there's no errors, uh, which suggests that everything did run successfully. I haven't seen it yet because I'm not blitting any of these images, but let's just see if I can print out this. Uh, it would have to be inside it. If I print out this animation list and just to see what it actually looks like to help visualize what's going on. Okay, so I don't know if that's going to help a whole lot. Probably not. So this is basically just all the stuff that says surface. It's just a bunch of those individual images. So you can see that, for example, 162 by 162, that's the coordinates that I fed in. So it's basically saying that within that massive list, if I go to the top, we're starting off with a list and inside the list is another sub list that contains all of these items. Uh, I should have an end here. So that's one list. So that there is the idle animation. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten individual surfaces within that first list. And then we go on to the next one. So then comes the next animation and so on. And every time you see one of these square brackets, that's the start and end of a list. So this is actually showing uh, a bit crudely what it is that we've just achieved, which is that we've created one big list 
that has a whole bunch of individual lists inside it that have all of those images. Okay, so we finally loaded all this data in, all these images are stored. Now, what do we actually do with this? How do we show these images on the screen? So there's gonna be a few more variables to add into this constructor, first of all. Underneath this animation list, I'll add another one that was gonna be called self.action. And this action is going to determine what the player is currently doing so that we know which animation sequence to show. Is he attacking? Is he, is he just idle? Is he running? Has he died? So we'll just set an action of zero to begin with. And I'll add a little comment here to, and I'll just copy it across from my snippets to explain what these are going to be tied into. So zero is going to be idle, one will be run, jump, attack one, attack two, hit and death. So this is how I'm going to determine which animation is going to be run. I'll just change the action. And as soon as I do that, it's going to run a different animation. So we have that variable. And then I need another variable, which is called frame index. So I'll explain this one uh, when I come to use it. And then lastly, I need self image. So self.image is going to be taken from this animation list. So this is where I'm finally saying what image I actually want to show on the screen. So I know that I need to take it from my animation list. And the animation list is a, con a container of lists. So the first index is going to always be which animation sequence I'm in. Well, I've just explained that that's determined by the action. So then when I've determined which action I'm in, I need to know, okay, well, which frame of the action am I in? So if I'm saying that I am in the idle animation, am I halfway through it? Am I at the end of it? Am I at the start of it? Well, because we're just loading the, oops, I need to close this down. Because we're just loading the first image, I want to start the animation right at the beginning. That's what this frame index is for. So I'm going to start it at self.frame index, which is zero. As this frame index variable increases, we run through the animation onto the next image, next image, and so on. Okay, so now for the moment of truth, let's go down to the draw method. And we've got this rectangle in here at the moment. So we'll keep the rectangle where it is, but on top of the rectangle, I'm going to draw the actual image. So I'll say surface. Remember, it's not screen within this code because I'm feeding in surface as an argument here. Let's say surface.blit. What am I blitting? Well, it's going to be uh, it's going to be self.image. So self.image. And then I need to give it the coordinates. So the X coordinate is going to be at my rectangle position. So self.rect.x. And then the Y coordinate, self.rect.y. This isn't going to look very pretty to begin with, but let's see if we can at least get something on the screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> We've got this tiny little wizard sitting there, kind of floating in the... Well, I say, no, that's the wizard over there. We've got the warrior over here. They're both in the wrong place. They're relative to the rectangle. They're in the wrong place. They're too small and so on. But we finally got the image loaded in. So there's a few things to fix there, but at least now that there's an image loaded, we can fix them one by one. Uh, first of all, let's get rid of this print statement because it's just filling it up with nonsense. So let's get rid of this. And we go back into the main file. Now, remember I said that this warrior data and wizard data lists are going to expand over time. So the next thing I want to add in here are individual scales. So we'll say wizard, no, it should be warrior first. Warrior scale is going to be four. Wizard scale is going to be three. The reason for this is remember the warrior and the wizard have different image sizes. So when I scale them up, already they're too big or sorry already they're different sizes when i load the game as normal so you can see this guy is quite small the wizard is a little bit bigger than this guy is so i can't scale them by the same amount i need to give them different scale values to get them to come up to around the same size so now i just need to add this within my data so we'll add warrior scale here and we'll add wizard scale as a second variable within this list Okay, so I don't need to change anything on this side because that warrior data is being fed in just as it was, but I just need to extract a little bit more data within the constructor. So now I can add a second one here to say self dot image underscore scale is equal to data one. So at index one, it's now going to take that second point from the data list. So now that I have an individual scale for each one of them, I go back to this load images method and where I'm loading my temp image, I'm not going to put it straight into the temporary list as it is. I'm going to load that image, but then I'm going to scale it up a little bit accordingly. So this section here 
is going to change. So now it's going to say, and I'll type it out above first and then I'll just copy and paste it. So it's going to say pygame.transform.scale. What am I scaling? Well, it's the temporary image that I've just extracted. And now I need to give it a new X and Y width. Sorry, sorry, I need to give it a width and a height. So the width is going to be self.size, which I've already given as a variable, multiplied by self.image scale. And then the Y, or rather the height of it is going to be, well, it's going to be the exact same, it's a square. So we can put that in next to it. So just make sure I close my brackets correctly. There's one more. So if I now take this line, I'm just typing out there temporarily and I put it in here, then what I'm going to be putting into my list is a scaled up version of this image. So let's just run this again and see what we get. Okay, there we go. The image is definitely bigger. It's gone off the screen now. And so is the, war the wizard. He's completely disappeared. But I know that the image sizes are now correct. So the next thing I want to do is add some kind of offset to be able to move these guys back into position and to be positioned pretty much where their rectangles are. So we go back into the main file and where I've got my scales, I'm going to add another variable here. So this will be warrior offset. And this offset is going to be a list because it's going to contain an X and a Y value. So this is just how many pixels I've worked out I need to offset the images by to make them kind of sit in the right place. So it was just trial and error. I know that these are the correct values now, but if you were to change the scales of all these things, if you were to kind of change the screen size, this would be off. So you would have to play around with the numbers to get it to be in the right place again. So we just need to pass that back into this warrior data. And then I repeat the process below for the wizard. So we say wizard offset equals, so these values are a little bit different. And we pass that in here as the last variable. Okay, so that's, I don't think there's anything else to add to these warrior data and wizard data lists. But now I can extract that information on the back here through my fighter class. So underneath this one, just to keep it all kind of in the same place, I'll say self dot offset is equal to data two. So now I've been able to process or extract all the information from that list into individual variables assigned to the class. Now, finally, if we go back down to the draw method down here, instead of just drawing the image as it is directly onto the screen, I need to play around with these X and Y variables based on that offset. So now I take this rectangle X coordinate just as before, because that part is correct, but then I add a little offset to it. So I want to minus self dot offset zero, which is the X offset multiplied by self.image scale, because of course that's going to change depending on how big or small I want the image to be. So that's the x-coordinate, and then I do the exact same thing for the y-coordinate, but for the offset I take it index 1. Multiply that by self.image scale, and let's just see, I've got the right number of brackets. So now I should be able to run this and get the correct size images in the correct places. And there we go. Okay, the images have loaded in correctly, We've got them standing there, uh, they're facing the wrong way, and they're not animating, but we'll we'll deal with that next. For now, you can see that they're in the right place, and I can actually move this guy around, and I can still attack this other guy. So first of all, to fix the, the fact that they're not facing each other properly. So this guy's facing the wizard, but he's facing the wrong way. And if I move past him, he doesn't look around. Well, remember, we've kind of already addressed this previously, where I had this self.flip variable. So all I need to do now is just use this variable within my draw method. And I just need to add one extra little step here. So before I draw anything onto the screen, I'm going to take, I'm going to create an image that I'm going to be using to put onto the screen and I'm going to flip the original. So we'll say image is equal to pygame.transform.flip what am I flipping? Well, it's the actual image. So it's self.image, which is what I was previously just putting directly onto the screen. I take that image and then I need to decide whether I want to flip it on the X or Y axis. Well, I want to flip the left and right. So it's the, the first variable is self.flip. The second variable is always false. So I don't want to flip them up and down the way, just left and right. So that's the, I suppose it's around the Y axis, up and down the way. No, <laughs> left and right, but it's around the Y axis. 
So now I'm going to have a flipped image, which means that rather than blitting the self.image variable, I'm actually going to blit this new image, which is the flipped one. If I run this again, oh, wrong one. Now this guy is facing him. He's not facing the right way, but that's because I'm not calling his move method. If I run past him, my warrior flips around. So the warrior is always flipping around the correct way. The wizard isn't, and that's simply because I'm not calling his move method yet. So the code for, or the logic for flipping these guys around is handled within the move method. But since I'm not moving him, that part of the code doesn't get run. Now there are going to be other instances where the move methods aren't being run. So for example, when there's an intro sequence to the game, and that means that when I first run the game, this guy is going to be facing the wrong way. So I want to overcome that. I want to make sure that he starts off facing to the left. He wants to start facing the warrior right from the beginning. And to do that, if we go back into this fighter class, remember right at the start I had self.flip is equal to false. Well, that's not necessarily true, right? Because it's only true for the warrior, but the wizard is supposed to flip around. So I'm going to add an extra argument within this class. So after, uh, after my x and y coordinates, in here, I'm going to add another one, which will be flip. So now rather than saying self.flip equals false, I'll say that it's just equal to flip. So whatever I feed in here is going to be the default value. So the wizard, well, the wizard's okay. We'll set false as before, nothing changes there. Uh, sorry, wrong way around. The warrior is okay, nothing changes there. But the wizard does need to flip around right from the beginning. So if I run this again, now he is facing the correct way. He's still not going to turn when I go past him because I'm not running his move method. But this guy is, so I know that the code is working correctly. Okay, so now I think we've pretty much got everything in place to start working on the animation. So like I explained when I was going over the sprite sheet, the animation is just going to be a sequence of individual images, which we've already got, we've already stored them in a list. We just need to play them one after another. So we need some kind of timer that's going to allow us to play one image for, say, half a second, then move on to the next one, and so on. So let's go into the fighter class and add this timer into it. So just underneath where we've defined our image, I'm going to say self.update underscore time is equal to pygame.time.get underscore ticks. So this is just going to measure the time when this fighter was first created. It's like taking a timestamp at that instance. Now underneath the move method, we're going to create another new method here. And this is where I'm going to handle the animation and a couple of other things. So I'm just going to call this an update method. So we'll say handle animation updates. I'll say define update. It doesn't need any arguments except for self. So this update method is always going to be updating the current image. So it's going to determine which image of the frame or the animation we're going to be showing on the screen. Now we already know how to do this. So self.image is taken from the self.animation list. And it's based on, first of all, the action and the frame index. So that means that all you need to be doing is increasing this frame index and the animation is just going to run by itself. So let's add some kind of timer or some kind of cooldown for this. I'll say animation cooldown is equal to, uh, let's say 500. So this is milliseconds. So each animation frame is going to take half a second. Once that time is run out, we'll move on to the next one. So let's make that check. Let's say if pygame.time.getTicks. So measure the current time right now. In fact, let's add a little note at the start just to explain what's going on here. So we say check if enough time has passed since the last update. Uh, add a comment here as well just to explain all this stuff. So update image. Okay, so we update the image. So how do we check if enough time has passed? Well, we get the current time, and then we take it away from the last time we updated. Now remember, this variable is already created right at the start in the constructor. So this update time is recorded as soon as we create the instance. So from that point, if the current time minus that time, when it was first created, is greater than this animation cooldown, so if half a second has already passed, well then, let's just move on to the next frame index. So we'll say frame index is increased by one, but we also need to make sure that we now reset this timer. So self.updateTime is the current time. pygame.time.get_ticks. 
Now to start with, this should be enough to get the animation working. So let's go back in, run the code, and see what happens. And nothing. So I guess it wasn't enough. Uh, what have I missed? Well, I missed something pretty obvious, actually. I've never called this update method anywhere. So I've created it, and I've defined it, but I'm not calling it on the game loop. So we go back here. And uh, let's see, where do I put this? I'll put it above the draw method. So I want to make sure that I get the latest image from the animation first, and then I draw it. So it's say update fighters. And I'll just copy this, put it up there, and I'll just say, instead of draw, this changes to update. And it doesn't need to get an argument, so we'll move screen. So that's update and nothing else. Okay, let's run this again. And there we go. So you can actually see they're moving now. So there's a very, very slow animation. And then I get an error. So let's let's try it again. It runs through. You kind of see this animation happening. And then it looks like it gets to the end of the animation and I get an error. Now the error says list index is out of range. So what's essentially happened there is we're going through this animation the frame index variable is increasing by one every time we get to the end of it we try to load the next frame so we get here and then we try to load the next one well there's nothing there it doesn't exist so that throws an error so what we need to do is return the animation back to the start in that case so underneath this code uh, this code is fine we'll leave it as it is we'll add another section that says check if the animation has finished so if self.frame index, so the index that we're trying to access next, because we've just increased it, if we're moving on to an index that doesn't exist, meaning that it's greater than or equal to the current length of that list, so self.animation list at self.action, oops, self.action. So basically we're saying that if the animation index or the frame index that we're going to try and access on the next iteration of this, if that's gone beyond the actual length or the number of individual frames within this list, well, then we can't really access it. It's going to throw this error. If that's happened, then it means we've gone to the end of the animation already. So we just need to go back to the start and be, start the whole thing again. So self.frame index just becomes zero. And this way we keep a continuous loop going. So every time we get to the end of the animation, this section triggers and we go back to the beginning again, rerun the whole thing. So let's try it again. They're going to animate through, bob up and down, and then it should just keep going. So what I can actually do is speed up the animation. I deliberately left it quite slow just to make it a little bit more obvious when it came to the end what was going to happen. But if we set this something like 50, it's going to be a lot smoother. So now it actually looks like a little animation. They're just standing there bobbing up and down. Now, of course, there's nothing happening when I move. It's always just in this idle animation. Even when I attack, it's just in an idle animation. It doesn't do anything else apart from that. But now that the core of the animation process and all the images are set up, it's actually not that difficult to add more into them because I know they're already there. I've loaded them all in. All I need to do is change this self.action variable. So as soon as I change that to something else, I'm going to run a different animation. So let's add in a running animation. Now to make sure it all works smoothly, I do need to add in a couple of additional triggers. So just under this val underscore y variable, I will say self.running is equal to false. So we'll begin in a non-running state. And then we go down to the move method here so that whenever I move left and right, I also trigger that variable. So I'll say self.running is now equal to true. So as soon as I hold one of these keys down or I press them down, I go into a running state. But when I release them, I want to go back into a non-running state. So I want this variable to be set to false as soon as I'm not pressing either of these keys. So I could add another if statement, but what I'll actually do instead is just reset that variable right at the start. So up here where I'm resetting or initially defining some variables, I will say that self running is equal to false. So essentially it's going to start off in a false condition. If I press one of these keys to move left or right, it will set to true, but at the next iteration, it's always going to come back to false. And if I'm not holding these buttons down, then it will never trigger these. So now we can use this. If we go into my update method, and I did say that here, I'm going to handle animations as well as a couple of other things. So the other thing is I check, check what action the player is performing. So this is how I'm going to determine which animation sequence to run. 
So here we just say if self.running, which is that variable I just cr created, that trigger, if that is equal to true, well then self.animation, or sorry, self.action becomes one. Remember, that's kind of just how I set them up from the sprite sheet. So this bit here, this note explains what each of the numbers relates to. And it's just the way the sprite sheet is structured. So zero is idle, but one is running. So they just correlate to the structure of that sheet. Now, if we go back and run this and I move, now you notice it works straight away. So I am now running. However, as soon as I stop, I'm still running. So there's, there's a little bit of a, an issue to figure out there, but I can see that the animation is working correctly. So what I want to do here is go back into this update method and just expand on this little section here. It's going to grow as we add more and more actions in. But basically I'm saying that if self.running is true, then the action becomes one, but the action never goes back to zero, which is remember idle. So what I need to do here is add an else statement. So if self.running is not true, well, self.action becomes zero. So let's run this again and run one. And now I should be able to run. Uh, it did stop and I wasn't expecting it to happen straight away, but I can explain what's happened. So it is kind of working now. You can see that I'm able to run an idle, but it's throwing an error every now and again. It's not immediately obvious why this error is happening. However, the problem is there's a different number of animation frames between these two sequences. So this one's got 10 idle, but running has only got eight. So what happens is that if I am in my idle state and I'm at frame index nine, and I try to change my animation to the next one, this doesn't have nine frames. So it tries to access an index that's not there, it throws an error. So I need to be a little bit smarter with this update section here. I can't just flick the animation, uh, sorry, the actions over to a different number and expect it to work because I need to look at the frame index as well. So I'm actually gonna create a little helper function here. So it's gonna be another method. I'm just gonna put it at the end near the draw method. It's gonna be quite a simple and small method. So we'll say def update action and itself. And what it takes is new action as an argument. So now rather than just changing my self.action variable, I'm actually gonna feed it through into this method and I'm gonna put the action in here. And here we'll do a little check. So we'll say check if the new action is different to the previous one. So that's just an if statement. If new action, which has just been fed in, if it's different to the current one, so if self.action does not equal the current self.action, then that's fine. Then we can just set self.action to this new action. So this, this section of code actually is not really that different to what I'm already doing here, right? I'm basically just here. I'm a bit more explicit. I'm just saying, okay, make it action one here. It is an additional check. First of all, I'm saying, am I already running or am I already idle? And if I am, then we don't need to do anything. But if I'm not, then that's fine. Let's change to the action that's being requested. But here's the important step. I need to update the animation settings. So I need to reset the frame index. So we can't just go from idle to run halfway through the animation. If we go from idle to run, that's fine. But we now need to start running from index zero. We also need to check when it was last updated. Well, we've just changed the animation. That means that the update time is right now. So pygame.time.get underscore ticks. Okay, and that's it. That's this helper function or method created. So now I can actually call this rather than doing this directly. So instead of self.action equals one, we say self.update action. And the argument is going to be one. And then down here, it's going to be update action to zero. Now if I run this again, you won't really notice a difference, but the error is gone. So as soon as I stop one animation, it flicks into the other and it begins it from the start. Okay, so let's keep this going and add in more animations. So the next one to do is the jumping animation. We'll go back to this fighter class and I think all of the triggers that I need are already here. So I've already got this jump variable, which is going to be affected by this W key. So as soon as I press W, I jump and this variable gets set true. So I should actually be able to just use that directly within this update section up here. And now we're gonna add in above the running check. So we'll say if self.jump is equal to true, then we update the action. And now this action is going to be 
number two. I just need to make sure that this is an elif. Now the sequence of this is important and uh, you can kind of play around with them, doing them different orders and you'll see why, but it does kind of affect how the animations are structured. So if I run this again, so I can run around, that's fine. And I can jump and now you can see that there's a little, just puts his knee up and a little jumping animation. And as I jump over him, he still flips around. So this back and forth flipping when I move to the other side of the enemy is still working correctly. Okay, so that's a couple more, well, that's a couple animations added in. So now let's do the same thing for attacking. Now again, I should have most of the variables defined. So I've got this self.attacking trigger and my attack type is set to zero. And then within this move section, I set my attack type. Now I've just noticed there is actually something that I've missed here, which is that I'm not resetting the self attack type to anything. So what I should do is just as I've done with running, I need to make sure that I do self dot attack type is equal to zero. So we won't have noticed the problem with this because I don't have an attack animation yet, but as I add it, this may become a problem. So this just makes sure that it always starts off as, well, nothing, no attack. And then once I press either the R or the T keys, it defines which kind of attack I'm doing. So then we go into this update method again, and just above all of this stuff, we add an additional check. So now we say if self.attacking, is equal to true. So now you can kind of see how all of these triggers are coming in useful because these are effectively just defining what the player is doing, what state he's in. And then I can use these to control the animations and control a few other things. So if self.attacking is true, that's fine. But remember there's two different actions because there are different attacks. So there's this attack, attack one, and then, and then there's also this attack, which is attack two. So I need to define which one I'm currently in so I know which animation to run. And that's where self.attack type comes in. So I have self.attack underscore type is equal to one. So that's the first attack. And we say self.update action to three. Otherwise, or elif, self. I'll just copy this down. No point typing all out again. So if we are doing the other attack, self.attack type two, then the animation action is going to be four. And just remember then that this becomes an elif. So we can have two ifs in a row like that. It'll work, it won't give me an error, but it will mess up the way the code is working. And actually what I'm gonna do here just to, because it is gonna get a little confusing with all of these, I'm just gonna add these little hints back in. So one is run, two is jump, then three up here, so three is attack attack one and then four is attack two. So it just means that at a glance, I don't have to go back and forth. I can just see what these are meant to be. Okay, so let's try this. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's throw an attack. Okay, it's run attack animation and then it's just kind of going crazy. It just keeps attacking with the same animation. Now, the reason for that mainly is because we have this self.attacking variable, which is set to true but it's never set back to false. And I deliberately left that previously. So when I was working on the attacking code down here, I remember I set the attacking variable to true, created the attack rectangle, and then I stopped more attacks being created as a result. And I never reset this variable back to false at the time. And that was because I want to use the animation to be able to do that. So the idea here is that when the animation is complete, normally, when we were looking at this animation here, we just reset back to zero. We just reset the frame back to how it was. And well, that is what's happening, right? He's throwing an attack, it's finishing, and then he just keeps doing it over and over. So with the attack, what I want to do is when the animation is finished, if the animation is an attack, then we go back to idle. We don't just keep attacking. We don't keep resetting back to the start. So that's actually where I'm going to be checking or changing this attack trigger back to false. So we need to add a little bit more logic to this animation sec section here. So I'll just add a note first of all. I'll say check if an attack was executed. So it means that we've executed an attack, but we've also come to the end of the animation. We've finished this attacking animation. So if self.action is equal to three or self.action is equal to four, then I can reset that variable. I can set that back to false. So now if I go back, I should be able to run this again do an attack and then he stops. 
So at the end of the attack, that's all over. And now I can actually keep throwing more attacks. So I can come over here and just start laying into this dude. And there you go. So the animation for that is working. The only problem is I can just kind of sit here and just hold the attack button or I can just keep spamming it. There's no break between attacks. There's no cooldown for it, which I don't know. I think it'd be a bit more, uh, a bit more of a challenge and a bit more strategy in the game if the other player had a little bit of a cooldown after he swung his sword or after he uh, threw an attack. So let's add in a little cooldown here. So we go back into the fighter class and right at the top where, uh, where we're creating, so you can see there's quite a lot of these variables now. So we need to add in one more underneath attack type. And this is going to be self.attack cooldown. And it begins with zero. So this is just me defining the variable so we can then go away and use it later on without throwing any errors. And now we go back into the update section. So this animation bit that we just updated here where we said if the frame, if the animations are finished and then we threw an attack, we end the attack. The animation, or sorry, the attack is over. At the same time, we want to set up a cooldown. So now that the attack is finished, let's say the attack cooldown is set to 20. Or right, let's go with 50. Well, now I need to actually make sure that this attack cooldown prevents me from throwing more attacks. So this attack method that's right below there's no trigger on it, there's no check against this attack cooldown. So that's what I need to add in. I need to add an if statement first of all that says if self.attack cooldown, if this is zero, then that's fine. We can run all of this code that's underneath here. So we can indent all this stuff. I guess I'll keep this as well for now, so I better indent that as well. I will delete this rectangle eventually, but it's just to show us what's going on. So if I run this again, I'll be able to throw my first attack, and that's it. And then I'm on a cooldown. So I have this cooldown which is stopping me from throwing more attacks. That means that I need to make sure that I'm actually counting down this cooldown. So we go back up to my move method. And where is it? So we've got ensure players are facing each other. Just underneath that, let's add this little cooldown. Apply attack cooldown. And I'll say if self.attack cooldown is greater than zero, which has just been set to 50, and then just subtract one from it. Attack cooldown is reduced by one. So this is just going to give me a little timer. It's not using the actual time. Uh, I could do that, I could use time instead, uh, but I guess it doesn't really matter too much. So this is just gonna give me some kind of cooldown that stops the player attacking over and over again. So if I run again and I just keep hitting R, you can see there's a little bit of a delay. So I'm holding R right now, but there's a slight delay between the attacks. If I switch to holding T, you can see I'm changing to different types of attacks. So both of the attack types are working. And actually that cooldown is maybe a little too long. Let's change it back to 20. Okay, so let's keep going with the animations. Now I've got the first five done. Uh, so there's the hit animation. So this is when one of the enemies attacks the other. The, the one that's being attacked takes a little hit. So there's three frames here just to show that. So let's add that in. And again, this is just going to need another trigger. So we go back up to the top here. And where should we put it? Just underneath attack cooldown, we'll say self.hit is equal to false. So it starts off, set as false. And then as soon as there is an attack that successfully hits, we'll set that trigger to true. So we go back into the update again. And it's just the same process now, so you'll be familiar with it. I'll we'll say if self.hit is equal to true, then self.update action, and this action is number five. Add a little comment to say that five means hit, and we just change that to an elif. So let's see if, I uh, know actually that's not gonna work straight away because we're never changing that variable, that trigger to true. So that would come within this attack section here. So this bit here shows that we've made a successful attack. The target's health is reduced by 10, the target's hit variable is also set to true. So that means that we've hit the target and they should now run through their hit animation. So I run through and if I go over and hit this guy. <laughs> okay, so it, it worked and it didn't work. So you can kind of see that he's gone a little bit crazy with, uh, I, I don't know what he's doing, but basically just running through the hit animation constantly. And that's because I'm not resetting the hit animation. So the hit animation finishes and it just keeps going in this loop. 
I need to do the same thing as I did with the attack animations. So when they come to the end, they need to just snap out of that and go back to idling. I did also notice there though that the animations were all running a little bit hyper speed. And the reason for that is because when I was messing around with the attack animation, I changed the wrong cooldown. So I changed my animation cooldown from 50 to 20, but actually I was trying to change the attack cooldown from 50 to 20. So that should get the animations. Yeah, that's a little bit more normal. They were a little bit uh, hyper there. Okay, so now we just need to go back to this section that I'm on right now, where I'm looking at the end of the animation. So I'm saying that we've come to the end of the sequence. First of all, we check, were we attacking? If yes, then we stop attacking and we go back to idle. Then let's check if damage was taken. So then I just say if self.action is equal to five, which means that the well self has been hit, then I need to reset that self.hit variable. I need to set that trigger back to false so that we can end that section of the animation. But there is also another thing to add here, and it's difficult to demonstrate. It's just a bug that I'd noticed when I was making this game. If one player attacks and the other player attacks at the same time, the attacks should essentially stop, right? One attack cancels out the other. So within this section here, I need to add another little check to say, if the player was in the middle of an attack, then the attack is stopped. So that means that if the animation for hitting or for being hit has just finished, then self dot attacking is also set to false and the attack cooldown oops, self dot attack cooldown is also reset back to 20. Okay, so now let's see if this animation works any better. If I go over and attack this guy, he takes a hit and then he comes back down to his idle animation. So that's working correctly. I don't have the controls for the wizard yet, so I can't really demonstrate it on the warrior, but I know that it's going to be working in the same way. The animations are all loaded in pretty much in the same process. And now there should only be one final animation to add, and that is the death animation. So when the player's health runs down to completely to zero, they need to go through the death animation. So for that, we'll add one more trigger, which is self.alive. In fact, I'll put it underneath health because it kind of makes more sense to be under that. Self.alive is equal to true. So when they first start off, they're alive, obviously. And then we need to make sure that we set that to false when their health runs out. So we can do that again within this update section. So just above where I'm taking my hit, I'll say if self.health is less than or equal to zero, then, well, self.health just becomes zero. It's I don't think there's really a scenario where I could end up with a negative health because I'm reducing it by 10 every time. But if you change the variables and do 15 damage instead of 10, it's possible you run to below zero. So this just makes sure that the health bar doesn't go off to off, off the scale, basically. And self.alive is also set to false. They're no longer alive. So lastly, we need to make sure that the action is set to the correct animation. So number six is the final one, and that is death. And remember to set this to an elif. So I, I guess I could have done them in the opposite order, but uh, the animations just worked in the other way around. So we start with the with the latest animation and work back down to idle, making sure that there is an elif at each one. So let's run this again and. Actually, it's going to take a while to kill him. So let's just drop his health down to 10 to begin with instead of 100. So that as soon as I attack him, uh, and you'll notice the health bars respond instantly. So they're already showing the correct amount of health. So if I attack him, he's dead. Health bars going to zero. And that's it. He's, he's running his death animation. But just as with the attack and hit animations, he gets stuck in the loop. He just keeps running that one. With the death animation, it's a little different, right? Because when he finishes the death animation, I don't want him to just jump back up and continue idling. He actually needs to stop at the last frame. He needs to lay down and, well, just be dead. So that's what we need to do within this update method. So before I automatically reset the frame index to zero and go into these checks, I'm actually going to add another check. So first of all, we say that if the frame index is gone to the end of the list, right? So we've come to the end of the animation. Well, first check if the player is dead or rather if the player is dead, then and the animation. So we say if self.alive is equal to false, therefore the players died, 
Uh, well, the frame index doesn't go back to the start. The frame index actually just becomes the last frame in the list. So it's len self dot animation list self dot action, and I need to subtract one from here. So that's going to give me the last frame. So that's fine. That, but otherwise, so else we do everything else just as we had previously. So let's go over and stab this guy again. He dies, and that's it. He stays on the ground, and his animation is finished. So that's pretty much it. That's, I think, all the animations working correctly and loaded in. I haven't got his attack animations for the wizard, but from the fact that he's idling, uh, dying, and taking hits correctly, uh, it should all work fine when I do add all that in as well. But now that all of the mechanics and the animations are pretty much in place, there's nothing really stopping me from adding in the second player. So I can control player one, I can move him around, but I've got nothing for player two yet. Uh, because I've already set all up, I can just copy and paste it and just tweak a few values. So we go back into this fighter class here, which has grown quite a bit. And let's see, so it's within this section here, basically this movement section. I need to duplicate this and add additional controls for the other player. But first, I need to know which player I'm controlling. So actually, this class is going to need an additional argument here. So the first argument, just after self, is going to be player. And this is going to tell me, is this player 1 or is this player 2? So then at the beginning here, we say self.player is equal to player. And I will feed this argument in from my main, main code here. So when we create fighter 1 and fighter 2, before I define their x and y coordinates, I'm going to say fighter 1 is player 1 and fighter 2 is player 2. So now with that argument created, I can use that to differentiate which of these controls are going to be moving which player. So this section is correct. If self dock attacking is false, that's right. Uh, underneath that though, I'll add another comment to say check player 1 controls. So this stuff is only going to apply to player one. And how do I know if it's player one? Well, I just add an if statement to say if self dot player is equal to one, then all of this stuff below applies. So I can move all of this and just indent it within that if statement. Then I can just copy it, copy all of that down, keep it within this if self dot attacking check. So keep it all indented around here. Here, I think. And now we say check player two controls. So I'm just going to double check that my indentation is correct. So this should line up up here. Yep, it's lining up. So now if self.player is equal to two, well, I want to move in the same kind of logic, but I just need to change the keys that are going to be doing this. So when I'm moving left, instead of A, I'm pressing the left arrow key. So we just say K dot left, moving right, K dot right, jumping, K dot up. And then for attacks, I'm going to use the numpad. So I'm saying KP1, so that's keypad. Uh, when you press 1 on the keypad and when you press 2 on the keypad, you get a different attack. Let me just change that to KP1 and that to KP2. So that should be fine. That's all the controls there. However, I'm not actually calling that for Fighter 2. So I'm calling it for Fighter 1, but not Fighter 2. So let's just copy this one down and add it in here and then I just need to make sure I change the variables so it's actually fighter 2 and the target remember that's what this last argument here is is fighter 1 now let's run the code so I can still move this guy around jump and attack that's all fine but now I can move this guy around as well so he can move back and forth switches back to his idle animation he's got an attack he's got another attack and now let's see if he can kill this guy just to demonstrate that the animations are working correctly on both of them There's one little thing that I just need to add in here. It may not be obvious straight away, but if I kill the warrior, I can actually still move around. <laughs> so although he's dead, I can still slide and I can still jump. So not great. Uh, that is one thing that I still need to address. And that's quite an easy fix. We go back to the fighter class here and all of this movement stuff, all of the attacks, everything else, it's all wrapped up in this self, uh, sorry, this if statement here that says if we're not attacking so if attacking is equal to false we can do all of that well we just need to add another check here so we say and self dot alive is true so as long as we're actually alive then we should be able to move around but if the player's dead then they should just lie there dead and there we go I can no longer do anything with the uh, with the warrior 
So now the game is almost there. I'd say the, the mechanics are all pretty much in place, but it just needs to be polished up a little bit. So there's a few little things that we still need to add into this. Now, the first thing I want to do is add a countdown timer so that when the game starts, you don't instantly just start fighting each other, but it counts down three, two, one, and then you begin. And that's not too difficult to add in. So let's just add a few more variables for that now. So just underneath the colors here, I'm going to add another little section to say define game variables. And for now, I just need a couple. So we'll say intro count is equal to three. So I'll, I'll count down from three, two, one. Then I need to take the timestamp when the game first runs. So last count update is equal to pygame.time.getTicks. Uh, no, that's not right. So it's very similar to what I did with the animations. I just take a timestamp first of all. And just to check how this is all working, let's go into the main game loop. And where should we put this? I'll just go to the top here above moving the fighters. I'll just say print intro count. So let's run this. And okay, so I'm starting off with three. Of course, I can still move them around. So I actually shouldn't be able to move them while I have this countdown. So I know it's not counting down yet. I haven't added that in, but the player shouldn't be able to move when we're in the countdown phase. So I'm going to add a little if statement here instead. So we'll say update countdown and we'll say that while we're still counting down. So if this intro count, which remember I've defined as three to begin with, if this is uh, if this has gone to zero, so if we've finished counting and we're OK now, then we can move the fighters around because now the fight has begun. But until that point, I don't want them to be able to move. So if I put an else here, then it means that they're only going to be able to move once the intro count has reached zero. But until it has reached zero, well, then we want to be able to move that counter down. So first of all, we'll just display down here so I can see how much it is. And well, I'll display it afterwards. And then I'll say update count timer. So just as we did with the animations, I say if pygame.time.getTicks, so take the current time, subtract the last time we updated the count, if a second has already passed, so if it's greater than 1000 milliseconds, then we subtract one from the intro count, and we reset the last count update time. So we set that back to pygame.time.get underscore ticks. So just the same as the animations, nothing different there. And then once we've done that, we print the new intro count. So we start again, uh, two, one, zero. I never printed a three, but uh, it's all working. So if I run this again and try and move, I can't move them yet. So it's counting down and then I'm free to move. So the counter is working. It's just, it's just playing it down here rather than anywhere on the screen. So at least we're halfway there. Now to display text on the screen, I actually need to write my own function for this. So there's no direct function to be able to put stuff onto the screen. You have to take the text, convert it to an image and then blit it just as you normally would with any other image. Uh, before I can even go that far though, I need to define my font. Now I don't want to use a built in font. So I've actually got a open source font here that I've downloaded and it's within my fonts folder here. So I'm going to put all the links to all the assets that I've used in the description. They're all open source and free to use. Uh, but I need to make sure I load that font in first of all. So we'll just come down to the bottom here, just above where I'm drawing my background. And I'll say define, define font. And I will define two different fonts here at the same time. So first of all, I will define my counter font. So my count underscore font is equal to pygame dot font dot capital font and then I need to give the location of where this font is saved so in my case again you've got your root folder here then it's assets fonts and then it's two rock so I just need to put assets forward slash fonts forward slash two rock oh, that's wrong dot ttf and then the second variable is how big I want this font to be so this font is going to be pretty big so I'll go with 80 now at the same time, I will define another font. I'm not using it right away, but I will I will use it for counting my scores. So every time the player kills the other one, their score is going to increase. So I'll say score font. And it's going to be the same font, but it's just not going to be as big. So I'll set it to 30. So now that my font is created, 
I can create this function for drawing text. So we go up here and we say draw, well, no, we'll say function for drawing text. And we say define draw underscore text. So the arguments that this will take are, first of all, the text I want to display, the font, text color, and then the X and Y coordinates that I want to display the text on. So like I said, you take the text and you turn it into an image. So we say font.render, the text, true, and then the color that we want to render it in. And then lastly, once that's done, we go to the screen and we blit the image at the X and Y coordinates. And that's it. That's the draw text function created. So now I can go down into my main game loop where I was working on this intro counter section. And rather than printing the intro count down at the bottom, I'm going to use this new function that I've made. So before we update it, just at the start of the else statement, we'll say display count timer. And the function was draw underscore text. The string that I want to feed into it, well, it's going to be intro count, but this is an integer. So I need to convert it to a string first. So we'll say string intro count. Then the font that I want to use, which I've just loaded in as count font. Then the color, I don't know if I've defined red, but red is what I want to use. And the X coordinate is just going to go screen height over two. So kind of roughly in the middle of the screen. Uh, no, that's not right. Screen width over two. It's the height that I want to use. Screen height for the Y coordinate divided by three. So it's kind of in the top third. Now I just need to make sure I've called, defined the color red, first of all which I have. So I've got red defined and uh, that means this should work. If I run this now, okay, there we go. So I've got three, two, one, and then I can move around. Excellent. Now, the other thing that I mentioned I wanted to add was a score counter for when one of the players kills the other player. And, and that's fine, but that kind of goes hand in hand with actually detecting that there has been a kill and the game is kind of over. So when this has happened, I don't want to be able to move this guy around. I want to well, end it and give me the option to restart the battle again. So let's go and add a few more variables. Uh, we go back up to this section here where I'm defining my game variables and we'll add a couple more. So we'll, we'll put the score variable and the score is just going to be a list. So I could have uh, individual scores like score for player one, score player two. I could save it within the individual instances of the class, but I just chose to do it this way. So this list it's just going to correspond to player one score and player two score. And in fact, I'll add a little note here as a reminder. So player scores, and it's just meaning P1 and then P2. That's how the list is structured. So that's the score tracker. But I also want to be able to check whether the round is currently over. So we'll say round over begins as false. And then the idea is that when one of the players kills the other, round over is set to true. And that's kind of when we can trigger the fact that this round is finished. Let's start another one. But in between the rounds, I need to wait a little bit of time. I can't just kill the player and then everything suddenly resets. So, you know, I like my cooldowns. So we'll have round over, cooldown, and we'll set that to 2000 milliseconds, so two seconds. Okay, so with all those variables defined, we can now start putting in the logic for that. And we'll put that into the main game loop. So let's see, we've got the health bar, we've got the countdown. We update the fighters, we draw them on the screen. So I guess, yeah, it's just kind of at the end of all of that. Uh, we'll add a little comment here to say, check for player defeat. So first of all, I want to see whether the current round is still going, i.e. we're still alive or if someone's already died. So we'll say if round over is false, meaning that we're currently fighting, everything is okay. Well, then, as long as we are fighting, I need to be constantly checking if one of the players has died or not. So let's just check if the first one has died. So fighter one dot alive is now false. It's no longer true. That means that fighter one has been killed. If that's the case, well, first of all, let's increase the score of player two, which was at index one here. We increase it by one. So he's just scored a point. He's killed the opponent. And the round is now over. So round over is... E Oops round over is equal to true and then the counter round over time is equal to pi game dot time dot get ticks so again it's getting familiar now but this is all just my the cooldowns and the countdowns that i like to use here 
So let's check if player one has died. Well, let's just repeat the exact same thing for player two. So we copy this down and we change it to an elif. They can't really be both dead at the same time. So if player two is no longer alive, then it's player one who scored. So index zero of the score list is increased. Round over is true and the timer is reset as well. So that's fine. That's how we detect that the round has finished. In fact, let's see, will this run? Ah, I should have set this down to zero just while I'm testing. So I kill this guy. Okay, uh, I guess it probably is, but because I'm not displaying any of this information, I can't really tell. So maybe I need to do... Yeah, let's at this point, let's say print score. Okay, so let's try again. And uh, so if I kill the wizard... Hmm. Oh, of course, the, the wizard was supposed... Uh, I put this in the wrong place. Let's run again. So if the wizard kills the warrior, then that's going to trigger. There we go. Okay, so now it's showing that it has triggered and the score has gone from 0, 0 to 0, 1 because the wizard has now scored a point. He's killed his opponent. Okay, so this section is working correctly and round over is being set to true. Uh, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. Round over is being set to true. So this part of it is working correctly and I need to handle this end of round situation. Well, I already have an if statement here that says if round over is false, then do all this. Then I can just add an else to it. So if round over is true, meaning that we've just finished the round. Uh, well, the first thing I wanted to do is display this big splash kind of screen image that says the round is over and someone is victorious. So it just says victory. Uh, I've got this image here and we need to first of all load it in. So it's this victory image here. So before I actually do anything here, let's just put a pass. I need to make sure that I've loaded that image into memory. So we go all the way back up to where I'm loading in all of my other images. So I've got my background, my spreadsheets. Just underneath that, let's load another image. Load victory image. So victory underscore img equals pygame.image.load. And uh, I won't explain all this again because I've kind of gone over it a few times, but it's assets, images, this time it's icons and it's victory.png.convert alpha. Okay, so that's going to load this image in for me. And now we come back down to where I was handling all this round over stuff. So instead of this pass, I will say display victory image. So screen.blit victory image. And then the coordinates, uh, just go with 360, 150. So I kind of played around with these to get it more or less in the middle. Uh, let's try this again. And again, I forgot to remove that counter. Run over, kill this dude. And there we go. It's displaying victory at the top. The, it's not really resetting anything back though. So the fight is over, uh, but we're not starting a new fight. In addition to that, this guy can still move around even though the fight is over. So a couple of things to deal with here. Well, first of all, we've got this timer created, right? We know this round over time uh, has been taken. So now let's use that timer and count down. So we can say if pygame.time.getTicks. So if the current time minus the time when the round was finished, if that's greater than the round over cooldown that I'd set. So if I think it was three seconds. So if three seconds have passed, then we can reset everything back to the start. So round over comes false. The intro count goes back to three, so we can reset the counter as well. And then I actually need to reset the players. So both of the fighters instances need to be made again. So we copy this from up here and put it in here. I, I could do it a different way. I could add a reset method to the fighter class. It was just a little bit more work. So I thought this is for this kind of game, this is simple enough and it works pretty well. So let's run this again and I just go over and I'll swap around again this time. So it's the wizard that kills the warrior. So they should stand for about three seconds and there you go. Then everything resets, the counter goes back, the health gets reset and everything's just back to normal how it was before. So that's one of the issues fixed. The other issue though was that I can still move around even though the player's dead. So let's just address that one real quick. And the way we're going to do that is by feeding this round over variable into the fighter class. And I'm going to put it into the move methods because that's where movement is handled. So just this last argument here, we're going to add in round over. Now we head back over the fighter class and this is the move method here. So we need to make sure that we're taking the argument back out. 
round over and we just add it to this if statement. So this if statement here is essentially saying that as long as we're not attacking, as long as we're still alive, we can move around. Well, let's just add a third condition. So as long as round over is false, then we can do all of those things below. We can run around and so on. So I'm just going to remember this time to set this count timer to zero. So I don't have to wait each time. So if I run over and kill this guy, now I can't move anymore. So I'm stuck until the countdown resets and now I can move again. Okay, so that's all working pretty well now. Uh, there was one thing that I mentioned though, which was the score. I'm keeping track of the scores, but I'm not displaying them anywhere. So let's just add a score counter underneath both of these health bars. And because I've already written most of the functionality here for drawing text and so on, I can just use those same functions again. So we go back into the main game loop here and underneath the section that says show player stats, I've got the two health bars. So just under them, let's call that draw text function again. And the text I want to put on is first of all, player one. So P1 colon a space. And then we want to add on this, uh, this score. So player one score, remember, is from a list. So it's index zero, but this will be an integer. So we need to convert that into a string before we can use it. Then and given the font, so I defined a different font earlier, which was score font, color of red, X coordinate, Y coordinate, and then we're done. Now we do the exact same thing, copy it down for player two score. So change that to P2, change that to one, and then the X coordinate just moves along to 580. So it's on the right hand side of the screen. And there we go, we've got the two scores. Now if I kill this dude, player one score is just gone up by one. And let's go the other way around. Kill this dude, and there we go. Player two score going up by one. So now we're nearly there. Uh, I think the, there's only a couple of things to add on before we can finish this game. First of all, is these ugly looking rectangles. Now they were fine to be able to see what's going on. And you know, when I develop these games, I always use this kind of stuff because it really helps visualize what's happening, helps you debug things. But I don't need them anymore. The game is pretty much done. So let's go ahead and get rid of these rectangles. Uh, where was I drawing them? So there was definitely one at the draw method here. So here I was drawing, uh, yeah, I was drawing, that's the image, that's the rectangle being drawn. So let's get rid of that. And also within the attack method, I was drawing a rectangle here, which I don't need. And once I've done that, I don't actually need this argument either. So remember, I added that in temporarily. Uh, so from the attack method, I can remove surface. It just needs target, I'm pretty sure. And to just even that out, I need to go back up to, uh, I think it's my move method. Yeah, so my move method takes surface, which is fine. It needs that, I think. And then it passes that into my attack method here. So I can delete this. So attack should only have the target move that as well okay let's just double check this is working i don't get any errors yeah okay it's all working fine the rectangles are gone and i'm still able to attack correctly all right so the very last thing to do is to add in some music because right now it's a little bit dull the mechanics are all there but there's no sounds to the game so it'll just add a little bit of depth to it as well and adding a music is not too difficult so there's going to be music and there's going to be sound effects. And to be able to use them, we need to import another module from Pygame. So right at the top here, we'll say from Pygame import mixer. Then down here, before we initialize Pygame, we initialize the mixer in the same way, mixer.init. And then we can start loading in all the audio files. So I'll come down here and just keep all the kind of assets together. So above my images, uh, but just below all of this data stuff, I'll have another comment to say load music and sounds. So first of all, we'll load the music. So pygame.mixer.music.load and the location. So I'm not going to explain this again, but it's the same kind of logic. I need to make sure I give it the correct location relative to the root folder. So these are in the audio file, audio folder, and it's called music.mp3. So that will load it in. And then I need to set a volume for it because for some reason, uh, well, on my computer anyway, I find this, this soundtrack is quite loud. So music.set underscore volume. And I'm going to set it to half of its original volume. So that will load it, but then you actually need to tell Pygame to play it. So we say pygame.mixer.music.play. 
minus one, zero, zero, five thousand. Uh, so you can play around with these variables, but it basically just means that it's going to keep looping over and over. And I don't want it to come in really loud, like straight away. So it comes in and kind of just fades in slowly. Uh, so I'll run it. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but I'll run it anyway and see. So I hope that was picked up, but that was just playing the music in the background. Now I'm going to comment it out for now because I don't really want it to be there while I'm speaking. So the music is done. Now we just need to load in the sound effects. So I'm going to save them as individual variables. There's only going to be two. There's going to be one for the warrior and one for the wizard. So the warrior's one is a sword. So sword effects equals pygame.mixer.sound and it's saved in assets forward slash audio forward slash sword. So we loaded that one in. I'll set the volume of this one as well. And you can play around with these just to kind of adjust them to what you think is right. And then we load in the second one, which is going to be magic FX. So the location is the same, but it's just a different file name. Magic FX. And this one I'll set a little bit louder. So I'll just run it to make sure it loads. Okay, everything is there, but of course, now I need to actually trigger them. So whenever I'm calling an attack, I need to make sure that I call these sound effects as well. Now the issue here is similar to what I've kind of already covered in a few other aspects of this, is that what I'm loading here within the main file needs to then be passed through to the fighter class if it's going to be made use of in there. So that means that I need to add in another argument to these, uh, to these classes. So right at the end here, I'm just going to add another one that says sword effects so for the for the fighter one that's the warrior so that's the sound effect that he's going to get and then the wizard is going to get magic effects now we need to make sure because i've actually called this again uh down here where is it down here when the round resets i need to make sure i paste that in here because this also needs to have the additional sound effects otherwise i'll get an error when the round restarts so we paste that in there now we can go into the fighter class and make sure that we get this sound effect back out here. So I add another argument, say sound. And then just where I've got all of my attack variables bunched together, I'll add another one that says attack sound is equal to sound. And now to call this, all I need to do is just go to my attack method, which is somewhere down here. There, within here. And as soon as I execute an attack, so I think it's basically all of this stuff here. So it doesn't matter if the attack connects, which is this second check here. In fact, let's just add a comment. So execute attack. So as soon as the attack is executed, we want to play that sound effect. So we say self dot attack underscore sound dot play. All right, if I go back to the main file, run this again. And there you go, you should be able to hear the sound effects coming through. And that's it. The game is pretty much complete. I can reset some of these variables that I'd, uh, I kind of messed around with for debugging. So I can set the intro count back to three. I can make sure that they have full health when they start rather than just 10 health. Uh, and then that will be the game complete. So we'll, we'll reset the music and the game's finished. And there you go, that's a complete fighting game in Python made using Pygame from start to finish. So I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you did, then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel as it really helps and supports the channel. Thanks very much for watching.